Hello and welcome to this, the Field Service News webinars series. Um, here we're looking at some research and we're asking the question, is Field Service finally moving to the cloud? We're actually going to be looking at, back across some research that we've done with our partner on this project, Click Software, across a number of years. So we're going to see some really interesting year-on-year trends, um, some real solid data here that's identifying these trends. We'll be looking at the benefits of moving to the cloud. We'll be asking, are there still any barriers for those companies that haven't moved to the cloud yet? Is there any challenges, potential security risks or connectivity, for example? And finally, we'll be looking at how the cloud can be an enabler for wider technologies, such as the Internet of Things, augmented reality and so on, as we move through 2017 and beyond. Now, your hosts for this session are myself, Chris Alden. I'm the editor-in-chief of Field Service News, and I'm very pleased to be heading up the team that is now running what I'm very proud to say is the world's leading trade journal uh, servicing the field service sector. I'm also very pleased to be joined by Paul Whiteland from Click Software. Um, I'm sure everybody in the session knows who Click Software are because they're an iconic brand within our sector. But just as an overview, Click Software are a company that's helped define field service engagement. They've empowered some of the world's most customer centric and demanding organisations to optimise the full potential of every service interaction. Well, Click Software Field Service has become a new competitive lever to drive forward differentiation as well as adding business value. Their new offering, the Click Field Service Platform Edge, um, arms field service leaders with the smartest technologies, has a limitless technology forward platform, and utilizes the knowledge gained from a global community um, and really harnessing best practice there. They've been exclusively focused on field service since their inception and Click Software has managed billions of service engagements and is relied upon by nearly a million field service professionals every day. And a little bit about Paul uh, in his role with Click Software. Paul works with field service management leaders across a variety of different industries. And in fact, he has over 20 years experience in enterprise software, working on both the technical and business aspects of many of the areas that are fundamental to field service, including um, things like mobility and sensor technology, where he worked with Nokia, uh, data management, where he worked with Endeka, and machine learning, SAS, and GIS, uh, and we're here. And Paul brings that skill set, plus many others, to a organization that prides itself on being close to its market, so a very neat fit. And anyway, let's carry on with the webinar. Enough about us. Let's have a look at the research. As we mentioned, it's been something that we've looked at this topic. Um, Field Service News actually started looking at this topic back in 2014. Um, in 2015, we partnered with Click Software on a research project that was aiming to take a measure of the feeling towards the cloud as a platform for, for project productivity tools amongst field service professionals. So with a specific lens on Cloud as a platform for field service management software. Um, we worked to get together again um, in 2016 to follow up on the findings. And we wanted to see if some of the trends that we had identified in the previous research and some of the developments we predicted had materialized. So in this session, we're going to have a review of some of those trends. We'll also look a little bit towards 2017. Um, there's also a handout for this webinar, um, which is a research report that we put together towards the tail end of last year, which uh, gives us a, gave us the opportunity to really drill down into some of these findings. Obviously, today's session we're restricted a little bit by time, and there's an awful lot of data. So we we're keeping some of the the analysis, the the headline um, findings, but the the report that's uh, available as a handout will allow you to drill, drill a little bit deeper into the the findings. Uh, just to give you some understanding of the methodology and the kind of reach of this research uh, across both uh, years, 2015 and 2016. Uh, the research was conducted online, and we had uh, over 150 respondents for each uh, of the, the years, um, slightly more in 2016 as we went back and followed up with some of the people from the previous year's research. The respondents were all primarily field service professionals. Um, so we're talking about field service directors, VP field service, field service managers, etc. Basically, those that are responsible for managing a mobile workforce, those that will be actively uh, implementing uh, field service management solutions. And the respondents came from right across the globe. Um, 
from our homeland here in the UK, uh, the other side of the Atlantic with a number of responses from the US, but also in South America, countries like uh, Mexico, Brazil, um, all across Europe, Germany, Italy, France, Switzerland, and even places uh, further afield such as South Africa and India. So a real global flavour to the research. There was also a really good split in the research across companies uh, of different sizes. Um, for the for the analysis of the report, we've kind of broken those down into subsets, looking at um, the smaller companies being those companies that have less than 50 field service engineers, right through to companies that have uh, over 800 field service engineers in the enterprise realm. Um, so let's have a look at some of those initial findings then. So the initial headline finding um, is that over a third of field service companies are now using cloud-based field service management systems. In fact, that's 36%, so just over a third now. Um, what I thought was particularly interesting, Paul, and I'd, I'd be keen to get your, your thoughts here. As you can see from the graph on the right, there's a fairly even split there across companies of different sizes. Uh, companies with 51 to 300, 301 to 800, and 800 or more engineers, all around the 30% the, uh, mark. And there's a slight spike there for smaller organisations. Now, my gut feeling on that, Paul, is that that's heavily linked to do with the software as a service model that cloud solutions are often put together with. Is, is that something that you think would make uh, the cloud a more attractive proposition for those SMBs, those are less than 50 engineers? Yeah, it, it's definitely true. And I, I suppose in the interest of transparency, I should say that the Click has, has its own division called Street Smart, which is mainly focused on SMB organizations, and that's completely a SaaS-based model. And I think part of that is recognition that the, the lower cost of entry for those organizations into the space is absolutely a factor driving demand there. And so with SAS requiring uh, no um, infrastructure investment on, on behalf of those organizations, then it's certainly where we're seeing a, a lot of uptake and a, and a, lot, of, uh, a lot of excitement about the, about the promise. I suppose one thing that the cloud has done in that sense, um, by putting software that was, let's say, five, ten years ago, cost prohibitive for these small organizations, it kind of has that wider impact on uh, field service in a, in a number of different verticals where you can get these smaller, more agile companies now able to deliver the same kind of tools and have the same kind of service capabilities as companies that were primarily in the the, the mid to enterprise range previously. Um, it's, it's an interesting point, I think, Paul, that <coughs> services become um, democratized almost, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly say it's, it's sort of level the playing field there in that, um, yeah, a smaller company can access a lot of the same capabilities as as uh, somebody who previously has required an investment in sort of massive IT infrastructure uh, to, to be able to uh, generate that kind of capability. So so it's definitely le le level the, the playing field there. Of course, you know, the, the art and the secret is in, a, is a, in applying best practices mm -hmm. and, and making sure it works for your organization in the context of your business processes. Um, so, you know, there's, there's definitely some some art in there. But in terms of accessibility to, to these capabilities, uh, yeah, absolutely, the barriers have come down a long way through SaaS. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, let's have a look at some of the uh, your new comparisons then. Um, what we can see here, and this is really interesting, um, is that the chunk of companies in, in the pie um, on the right-hand side, which is the 2016 research findings, um, is... It, quite substantially bigger. Again, we're seeing a, a big growth there of companies that are now using the cloud, um, a leap from 28% to 36%. What perhaps puts this even more into context is if we go back to the 2014 findings, we would find that that 28% was down to 23%. Um, so what we're seeing is not only that this, this section is growing, um, it's grown for the second year running. And I think personally, I think that's a trend that's going to continue. Um, I think in 2017, we'll see that 36% grow again. Paul, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think that it, this is kind of a, uh, an unstoppable movement towards the cloud, that companies are just, that, that road is kind of continuing? It is, yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's a one-way street. We're seeing organizations move to the cloud. We're not seeing organizations move back from the cloud onto an on-premises deployment. People are, are happy with uh, the 
the capability that's been delivering, delivered over that mechanism. Uh, and I think we will continue to see the rate of adoption increase. I mean, organizations are getting over what have been some of the inhibitors that we've identified in the past. And I know we'll be looking at those um, over the course of this conversation. So, so the inhibitors are sort of falling away. And in terms of um, picking up some uh, momentum from uh, you know, the idea of the project it might have started a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. but by the time all budgets are aligned and so forth, and then organizations are picking up ahead of steam. And I think we'll, we'll find more and more um, momentum uh, into the future and that that rate of adoption will indeed continue to increase. It's, it's certainly what we're seeing um, in, our, in our sort of pipeline and the, uh, the trends that we're seeing in the market where, where sure. we operate. In fact, in that, that kind of leads us quite comfortably across into this next slide. We can see that the increasing rate of cloud adoption is indeed quickening. Um, if I drill down into the, the, the numbers there, um, the year-on-year -year growth in terms of adoption of cloud-based field service management systems uh, from 2014 to 2015, it was just 2.7%. But from 2015 to 2016, it, it lapped up by 8.2%. So that's year-on-year -year growth. Um, and that's a threefold increase. I mean, we're seeing that increase. We're not just seeing more companies move to the cloud, though. We're also seeing it happen more swiftly. And I think that ties in a little bit, Paul, with what you're saying there about the, the kind of the, perhaps the pipeline, the time it's taken for companies to kind of want to move across um, th this slide here I find particularly interesting. Um, this is a question we put to those companies that have moved to the cloud. And we asked them, how long ago did you move? Um, back in 2014, um, there was just under a quarter had said they've made that move in the last six months. So at that point in time, those guys have moved very recently. Um, last year, that had leapt up to a third of the respondents that were on the cloud had moved very, very recently. So again, we're seeing that rapid kind of uh, movement across the cloud, but we're also seeing it on an accelerated rate. Um, I mean, my, my kind of gut feeling on this, Paul, and it's interesting to get your take on this. Uh, one of my kind of thoughts on this was the shift is perhaps to the cloud is heavily tied with legacy systems. Um, and my thinking on that is, you know, if, if we compare field service to other divisions within the business, say marketing, even CRM, you know, with the, the example of Salesforce kind of really leading the way in the, uh, terms of cloud adoption. Um, mm -hmm. Field services perhaps had a bit of inertia, it's been a slight laggard. Um, if, we were, if we were on a marketing webinar right now, I'm sure these, these numbers would seem quite surprising to many that so few have actually made that move to the cloud. But field service tools are, of course, incredibly mission critical. And, and as service becomes a bigger role, um, in terms of customer interaction, it becomes even more critical to get service right. So I have a kind of gut feeling that a lot of companies have kind of waited, uh, almost a, if it's not broke, don't fix it, because there is a fear, a, 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 a natural reticence to not want to kind of have a huge upheaval, completely change systems on what's a mission critical uh, element of the business. Um, but I, I'm guessing now we're seeing this this kind of rapid adoption and this this, this momentum gaining because the tools that are available now, the the, the systems, even the Click Software system that uh, you guys were talking about at your uh, own conferences I attended towards the end of last year, where they are compared to where that product was five years ago is, is a quantum leap forward. So it's almost a case that companies now have to start making the move. And now they have to start making the move. It's sensible to move to cloud. Is that something that you 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 agree with? Is there am I perhaps oversimplifying things, or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I, I think you've nailed it. Um, I mean, there are, there are two sides to it. One is you know if it ain't bust, don't fix it, and and then the other is well, what is the business case for actually making making the shift? And I think the business case becomes more and more compelling on a couple of fronts. And on one side, the business case to move towards the cloud becomes more compelling. Um, because of because of the decreasing cost from an IT infrastructure point of view, the fact that you don't have to uh, undertake all of the IT care and feeding, and that the the SaaS provider, um, the field service management provider, takes care of all all of that, that's uh, you know that's a, that's a powerful argument, and that's that's um, the guts of it on a on a cost point of view, re reduction in the total cost of ownership. But of course, as you as you pointed out, there's also 
the benefit, there's the upside. And being able to add additional capabilities through a cloud-based deployment, being able to take advantage of some of the, ca some of the capabilities like uh, machine learning, like uh, being able to use computing power mm. to be able to optimize schedules in a way that you can't necessarily in an on-premises deployment. A, a lot of that increased capability and functionality, that's actually uh, not just adding uh, sort of to the, to the business benefit from a, from a top line point of view, it's also moving the needle on things like customer service uh, and NPS scores and those kinds of metrics as well. So I think all added up together, as you said, you know, there's a there's a in increasingly strong argument for it, and that counters the inertia and sort of the laggard oh. nature, of it, which is which is certainly true, and it's generated, as you said, it's because it's a uh, you know it's a sophisticated mission critical application, and and it's a big you know we we got to respect the fact it's a very big change management job to Absolutely. be able to uh, switch over. You can, this isn't software that typically you're sw switching in and out like. Uh, like some types of applications in the enterprise stack. This yeah. is so well integrated, uh, both in terms of a software uh, capability, but in terms of a business process and, and, and an overall workflow, that it, it really is something that, uh, you know, it's not a project you do every two years. Mm. This is, this is uh, something that you need to do, uh, do well. A, a very quick point before we move on there. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something you mentioned there about business processes. Field service management solutions, field service management systems, the, the decision on what to go with, uh, you know, which, which solution to choose, the implementation, is that a business decision or is that an IT decision to, in today's markets? I, I think it's, it's both of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's, it's difficult to say uh, is one more so than the other. Um, I mean, we just looked at the two sides of the coin being, you know, you can raise your differentiation in the marketplace by adopting improved functionality, but you can also take cost out of uh, the, the organization, both by being efficient, but also uh, by, by getting rid of some of the IT infrastructure overheads. Yeah. And so I, I, think, I think with something as uh, embedded into the fabric of an organization like field service management, I think it, it has to be driven by both of those parts of the world. It, it, it's not one or the other. It's uh, it's fundamental from a business point of view, but if it doesn't fit into an architecture stack or a philosophy that's being espoused by an IT group, then it's not going to have uh, a long-term success either. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just a, a brief aside, I think it's always an interesting kind of question to kind of pick up. Um, let's kind of continue on with a little bit of a look at the companies that aren't using the cloud at the moment. And I think, again, this adds further weight to the, the momentum argument that we both seem to be pushing uh, and, and kind of um, extrapolating on there. Um, this next slide shows us um, the response to a question we put to, to those companies that are currently still using an on-premise solution. Um, and we, we basically asked them, are you going to consider the cloud for your next iteration upgrade uh, of an FSM suite? Um, interestingly here, that the, there is a slight increase, a nominal increase of uh, uh, 3%, um, but basically we've seen over the, the two years worth of research that this trend has been borne out and sustained, uh, that all of those companies, a big, big sizable chunk of those companies that are currently using on-premise, have now got their eye on the cloud. Um, and I think that, that, that for me kind of suggests that the case studies are kind of coming to the fore. The the uh, examples of the benefits are coming to the fore. I think we've done. Uh, I would say that's probably a good suggestion that the, the education has um, uh, done its job for. Would you agree? I would. Yes, it's it, that's definitely part of it, and and part of getting the message out is is maintaining this uh, and increasing this momentum. Um, so, so, so I certainly would say that. I actually think that the, the yes number in these charts should almost be higher, just in terms of considering. And uh, so my perspective is that everybody should be considering a move to the yeah. cloud, if of course if of course they're considering a new FSM solution. And it may be that some of those no's aren't actually considering uh, uh, an investment in that area at this point in time. But I think there's a very small sliver who, if they are considering uh, a new FSM uh, solution should, shouldn't be looking at um, at the cloud or shouldn't be considering that. And the, those are organizations that maybe have some regulatory constraints uh, around the type of expenditure, either uh, 
capex that they're they're constrained by. Um, but you know, other than that sort of regulatory side of things, I mean, I think there is a you know there should be more consideration of cloud, um, and certainly we we see that in our in our customers and our prospects. Okay, okay. Um, just before we move on to the next section, which is going to look a little bit more at the the opinions of cloud in general from, from amongst the field service professionals we spoke to, rather than just specifically as a platform for FSM tools. For me, there's a couple of interesting things on this, these uh, two graphs on this slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, first of all, there is the the fact that the those that we've spoken to, and bear in mind that these uh, responses are generally in the main service professionals, so operations guys rather than IT guys. So it's interesting to get their viewpoint um, on, on the, the general perceptions. Um, it's interesting to see that we've now hit over the 55% mark, so over half of the respondents feel that uh, cloud is the future of enterprise computing. But for me, I think the more interesting point here is that this small column on the right of the 2015, although it being a nominal amount of 2% that had zero trust whatsoever in cloud computing, that's completely disappeared. And interestingly, alongside that, we see those that had very limited trust in cloud computing um, has also reduced almost by half from 13% to 6%. Um, and those, obviously, those uh, people have, have moved more across to either stating that they believe the cloud is the future of enterprise, or some saying, hey, look, we still have our concerns, but we, we definitely now seeing the benefits. And that cost-benefit um, uh, equation is starting to swing more in favor of the cloud. I, I have the kind of the feeling that we may be pushing on an open door a little bit, Paul, when, when it comes to kind of um, talking about the cloud now as, as something that's pervasive in in business, almost like people would have been talking about the internet, say, 15 years ago. Um, it's kind of got that uh, acceptance now. Um, and part of me thinks that that's perhaps a generational thing, um, you know, with more Gen Y guys being involved in the industry at uh, senior, more senior levels, of course, millennials coming through um, and, and the baby boomer generation moving across. Um, I think that's part and parcel of it. And I think we're starting to see uh, a, a general acceptance of cloud in, in the world of business. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely true. And there are, there are sort of pioneers like salesforce.com mm. um, who, who are definitely um, a bellwether really for the industry as a whole in, in terms of enterprise software. And they've, yeah. they've clearly got such a head of steam that this is um, absolutely accepted now. And you've only got to look at the growth of Amazon Web Services and so forth to see that this, yeah, this isn't a flash in the pan. This is absolutely the future mm. of the enterprise. And that's indeed why I thought in the previous slide that we looked at, you know, the, the percentage of organizations who should be considering cloud, you know, I think really that should be a, mu a, mm. a much larger slice. And uh, there are only really these regulatory barriers that should make it not uh, an area for consideration. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I think this dynamic is, you know, there's a couple of sides to the coin again. There's one that sort of the previous perceptions, sort of the negative perceptions are being chipped away. And, and one of the classics that I, I know we'll touch on a little bit in the future is, is the security side of things. And previously, you know, there's been lots of fear, uncertainty and doubt about putting information out there into the cloud. Um, I think, again, Salesforce.com has really shown that even very sensitive customer data, where there are, of course, lots of uh, protections and legal implications around how you handle that information, e even putting that data up on the cloud is being you know, a, a success, it, it's fair to say, and that the concerns around security uh, have really been diminished. Um, besides which, um, deploying a, a cloud-based solution and putting the security of that information in the hands of uh, professionals at the likes of Amazon Web Services, mm -hmm. um, they're very much on the cutting edge of it, right? They're, they're the people who are keeping uh, uh, keeping one step ahead of all of the bad actors and making sure all the, the patches are in place. And being able to do that as an organization and your own infrastructure, that is an increasingly difficult task, I think, with, with all of the you know the hacking and the uh, the bad actors and mm. so forth. So, so I think the negatives have gone down of uh, sort of some perceptions about security, um, and then the the positives, as we said, the the business case about you know 
um, being able to effectively outsource a lot of the care and feeding of, of the IT infrastructure, that's always good. The fact that you're getting automatic upgrades and the latest versions of the software are automatically being available to you in the cloud without having to go through upgrade windows and all, all of the internal processes around that. That's all goodness. So, yeah, it's absolutely, you know, it it's, comes through loud and clear on this chart that you know cloud is the future of the enterprise yeah. and again I, I would expect that to continue to accelerate yeah absolutely and you know we can what's interesting as well is as we look across at uh, the next slide um, it's it's pervasive it seems um, it's not just the big enterprise companies with big IT teams and, and well plugged in CIOs that can see the benefit of this it's not just the small players are, are, are probably the the greatest um, beneficiaries of the the SaaS model. It seems that right across the board, there is this belief um, that cloud is um, you know the future of enterprise computing, as you point out there, Paul. Uh, but let's have a little look at some of the drivers then to why companies are moving to the cloud. Um, now, there's some really interesting kind of bits to pick up on here. Uh, interesting. Point number one, first of all, scalability and the flexibility of the cloud for two years running was the most commonly cited driver as to why companies were making a move to the cloud. And that's up to 86% of companies citing that as a key driver for why they're moving. And I see that as a two-tier kind of thing, personally. Um, we've, we've got the, of course, the benefit that a cloud solution can grow with your business. But I think with within the field service world, um, it's also very important to remember that a lot of field service companies will be impacted by seasonality. Um, you know, I'm sat here in a cold London uh, right now, and I'm sure that the, those companies in my local area that are servicing boilers are probably getting a lot more call outs right now than they do in a, a nice warm month like June or something. So for them to be able to operate on a, a variable workforce approach, is um, very important. It means that they can run their businesses a lot more efficiently and a lot more cost uh, effectively. So cloud is a, a, a good tool for that in terms of scalability. You can either just dial down or dial up the licenses. Um, one that I think we've touched on a tiny bit, Paul, but I, I'd like to kind of put to you a little bit on this is um, less reliance on IT. Uh, so uh, up to 62%, so just coming shy of two thirds of the respondents said less reliance on IT is a key reason why they um, want to move to the cloud. Um, the the relationship between IT director and CIO and software vendor is 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 changed somewhat, hasn't it? Um, and I think the cloud's been quite a, a large part in that. You know, I think the role of the IT director is 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 quite different. The role of the IT department is different these days. Um, mm -hmm. Gone are the days of having um, a team of coders. Kind of tweaking your software, tweaking uh, the software to make it fit for purpose. Um, it, and the actual at the top end, the CIO, they, their role is as much vendor management and making sure that the, the the onus is on the vendor now with the cloud based uh, offerings to to deliver. Um, sure. As as a vendor, is, is that a fair a fair assertion to make? And is that something that has changed the way that you you interact with your customers? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, the, the sort of the ownership of the SLAs around things like uptime and response time has changed from a, a metric from which an internal IT organization was being judged into something that, you know, you've got some cast iron concrete certainties around uh, from, from a third party vendor. And so, you know, the dynamic of uh, managing that is, is very much uh, uh, an evolution of the, uh, the, the organization's function. Um, because that that SLA now now falls on the on the third party on the, on the software yeah. vendor, so that that's definitely a a, a, sh a shift. Um, uh, but I think I mean that means that uh, the software vendors. I mean, obviously we're, we're specialised in this area. This is our business, and being able to manage our computing resources to be able to meet SLAs in terms of response times and uptime is you know it's, it's it's our bread and butter we don't have to juggle that as an internal organization would be with many many different applications where you know that's a that's a constant juggling act and they've got to make make specific calls about where they put their resources um 
if you've got, got a situation with a SaaS-based model, um, you've got the certainty of, of, of that SLA there. And so, yeah, it become, becomes more about managing that. Mm -hmm. And then you get all of the goodness that we, we've spoken about. So you don't have to worry as an internal IT organization around the upgrades, the upgrades and the additional functionality um, flows in automatically because obviously the software is available in the cloud mm. and, uh, and we can continue to evolve that, um, you know, without the, uh, the typical and traditional overhead. So yeah, de some, yeah. De definitely some, uh, some changes there. Okay. It's interesting you talk about the functionality there, cause that's my next point actually. Um, we can see again, if uh, what, what, one thing I thought was very interesting across the, uh, two years of research that we can see here is these five key drivers stayed the same and they stayed in the same positions. It seems like there's a very kind of set belief of what the cloud will deliver. Uh, and functionality, both years, kind of around the 50% mark. Um, however, when we move across to the next slide, this for me was perhaps the most eye-opening piece of information in across the entire three years worth of research. Um, it's certainly the biggest, um, any, uh, biggest change in year-on-year responses at any point across the three years that we've been looking at this topic. And that's at, right at the bottom there. You'll see that functionality is let by 44%, if my maths is correct, um, mm -hmm. being the biggest single benefit being felt by those companies that have moved to the cloud. So, and that's leapt up from 26% in 2015 to 70%. So a, a huge amount of companies stating that's a, a key, key benefit. Um, is that the is that the effect of companies having been on the cloud for a year, two years, three years, and getting these instant, uh, these uh, constant updates, um, getting the added functionality? Um, is that just something that these companies are now starting to experience because they've been there and they've they've been experiencing the benefits of the cloud and they're seeing that come through? Um, and a second element to that question, Paul, um, is. Is it surprising for you that, that so many companies kind of say, well, that was the fourth most important thing that we chose to uh, move to the cloud, but actually now it's the, bit, it's the biggest thing that we're, the biggest benefit we're getting. Um, what, what's your kind of thoughts and comments around that? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's a surprise that there's mm. been uh, an increase in, um, and it's as much, maybe it's as an, a part of it is an increase in awareness of the functional capabilities and the differentiation around the, the cloud side of things. And, and some of that, I think, ties into the fact that you're getting automatic uh, updates uh, as the, the, the version of the software as a service evolves. Yeah. And so I, th I think organizations are typically used, you know, maybe they'd have a, an upgrade every year or so. And so they're used to sort of a, a, a big bang of, uh, of functional enhancements. But that's, that's kind of can be overwhelming from a change management point of view mm. to suddenly have a, a new version. Uh, are you really going to be taking advantage of all of those if you've got to train everybody all at that one point in time? And so you might throttle it a, a little bit. But you don't really have that same kind of constraint when you're having a, a constant flow of enhancements uh, through a through a cloud-based model, and so I think that some of this is to do with you know the rate of progress and the rate of rollout and the sort of the perception of this continual enhancement all the time of of the functional capabilities of the S FSM f um, system. Mm. So so the. That, that's one angle. I think the other angle, of course, is that there is additional functional capability with, it, with a cloud-based system. You, you're able to aggregate um, anonymized information from multiple sources and understand um, things like travel times, task durations. Uh, you can use uh, machine learning and predictive analytics on top of uh, some aggregated information that wasn't, a, that wasn't available before. And, and I think uh, some of the benefits of um, shared computing resources and, and this, the flexibility in scaling your computer resources is really important as well. So I'll, get, I'll give a specific example on, on the functional side of things. Sure. So one of the things that Click Software does is, you know, everybody says, oh, I'd like a, 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 an optimized schedule. Well, well, what does optimized schedule mean to you? It might mean, you know, minimal white space in the schedule but it might mean different things to different organizations. One organization could be prioritizing customer response times. Another one could be prioritizing minimizing overtime. Uh, another one could be prioritizing uh, something else, first time fix rate. Yep. And, and so uh, to be able to establish what is the right uh, optimized schedule for that organization at that point of time, 
Click's got a capability where we run you know, massive amounts of simulations to be able to look at the possible alternatives, look at the trade-offs and see what the influence of those trade-offs are on the KPIs that are important to the business. And so you need a fair amount of um, computing power mm. to be able to, uh, to, do, to do something like that. And it, and it can get a little bit spiky when you've got certain seasonal variations, as you, as you mentioned before. And so being able to take advantage of the uh, computing power in the cloud uh, is a, is a you know, huge advantage that enables that kind of capability. It enables uh, a, an organization just to be all able to run through many, many different scenarios and it enables us uh, as Click Software to be able to come up you know, as business imperatives change with a schedule that reflects this, uh, the, the new requirements. So, so there's a, that's a sort of an example of some functional enhancement that you know the, the cloud enables. And I think as more and more organisations become aware of this, again, you know, the snowball will continue to to gather and and continue to pick up ahead of steam. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And and it's it's in, it's an interesting example you put there because you know the we're talking about something that perhaps uh, on an on-premise system using just uh, you know, even even an organisation with a number of servers or etc. But well, the best one in the world, um, we're talking about something that may take weeks, months even, to kind of run that statistical analysis, uh, coming down to a matter of days, minutes even, perhaps. Um, so it, it's it's a very interesting kind of uh, uh, case to put forward there. Um, talking about cases putting forward, I don't think there's much more to add to this, final, uh, this additional slide. Um, now... You know, um, for full disclosure, I'm a big fan of the cloud. Um, having done this research for three years and kind of looked at the benefits and the risks, um, I, I firmly sit in that that group that says the cloud is uh, the future of enterprise uh, computing. Um, and uh, I, I, I can honestly say that I'm not getting any brown envelopes from the likes of uh, Microsoft, Azure, or Amazon Web Services to say that. I just genuinely think that it's, um, you know, it, it is the way that we're going to move in the future. And that's, a, that's backed up for the second year running by every company that we spoke to that were uh, currently using cloud and a cloud-based field service management so solution specifically, we asked them, would they recommend that over an on-premise solution? And 100% stated that they would. And that's across two years worth of data. We've had that same response. Um, I think that slide pretty much says everything it needs to on there, Paul, uh, unless there's any comment you want to add to that. No, I mean, I think it underlines the fact that uh, I think the phrase I used earlier is a one-way street. We're not seeing yeah. people go back from cloud to on-prem. There's, there's great reasons to do it. Uh, we recognize that it's not necessarily an easy shift. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually, in, in that context, it, we're very keen to make sure you know, we have got a perpetual, uh, a, a perpetual on-premises-based model yeah. as well as a cloud-based model. And we recognize that organizations they may be exploring the cloud, but aren't quite ready to do so. And that we can offer uh, an offering where, where you start on premises and then move to cloud over time. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to sync that with the buying buying cycle. You can sync that more with your sort of organizational cadence. And okay. so, you know, I think we're you know chipping away at some of the barriers there, recognizing yeah. that it is a big, big move. And for big organizations with massive change management considerations, it's it's a major major issue. Yeah, okay. Um, of course, it would be remiss of us to not address what seems to be the perennial elephant in the room when it comes to conversations around cloud computing, um, not just within the field service uh, remit, but obviously there's a lot of sensitive data in, in field service management solutions uh, embedded within them. Um, and that's the question of security. Um, however, I, I feel that having reviewed the 2016 findings there is that we are starting to see a change in thinking so there's a couple of points i've raised here paul i'd be keen to kind of uh, put some of these points to you and get your opinion um 48 of service professionals state that high profile breaches in security in the consumer sector have no impact on their perception of enterprise level cloud security and that's eight percent more than in 2015 and i think we can look at this in two ways paul i think we can look at it as it's great that the number of people that are able to kind of identify things like um, the iCloud hacking um, is, 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 shouldn't hold sway over their view on 
the security levels of companies like Microsoft, Azure, Amazon, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's good to see that move in the right direction. Or we could look at it and say, well, there's still 52% of companies that do have the mindset that if Apple can get hacked, so could anybody. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yes, I think uh, I think one needs to uh, more look at it through that latter lens, which is, you know, if Apple can be hacked, then, uh, you know, and there's elements of social engineering and, and so forth, but it might be easier for uh, an enterprise um, IT to say, well, that, that couldn't happen to me. Um, and some of this is, well, what's the attractiveness of the target? And I think it's, it's more difficult for this 48% of people to say, oh, well, some pictures on iCloud have been hacked. I, mm. I'm not a target for that kind of thing. I'm not a credit card company. I, I might not have that kind of information. So I, I'm not out there as a target. But um, I, I think this is a sort of a, um, I think that's that's dangerous because I think organizations are increasingly targeted. I mean, there's a, there's a wave of attacks around ransomware, which any organization yeah. is now, you know, people get it getting in either through social engineering or spear phishing attacks and so forth and being able to encrypt uh, organizational data and then essentially saying well you know if you don't pay up by yeah. bitcoin then you know we're going to we're going to blow this thing up and you're never going to see it again and so that puts a lot of onus on you know backup recoveries all of these kinds of things which is great for a you know to be able to move that problem out to a SaaS, to to a to a SaaS provider so i think um I think it's true that some of the headlines around uh, attacks in the consumer sector aren't necessarily very relevant to an enterprise IT organization. But you know, I think the thing that's driving these bad actors is uh, is uh, is cash, mm. and there are different ways to extract different uh, cash from all, all organizations in different manners. So it, it's certainly something, as I'm sure everyone would agree, nobody can take this lightly, right? Uh, yeah. Take this light, lightly, and uh, obviously having world-class security is very important. And uh, you know that's why a cloud solution, and in Click's case, that uh, you know partnering with AWS, where we get uh, a lot of that world-class capability. Mm. I, I think I've got a, a lot of a lot of confidence in that kind of. Well, I, I, yeah, and I suppose uh, the, the conversation I've had around this a few times is: look, AWS can't simply cannot afford for any one of their clients to be breached because their entire business model is on being secure and being able to sell that to organize and that security and the security of that platform alongside um, other benefits, of course, but the security of that platform is absolutely paramount in terms of dealing with, you know, the likes of Click Software, who then deal with your end customers. So I think there is there are very, very few companies in the world, even right at the top tier of enterprise um, across any industry, whether it be manufacturing, whether it be telco, etc., that can afford to spend as much money and as dedicate as much resource as the likes of uh, Microsoft or Amazon or any of these cloud providers can in making sure that their security protocols are at the very, very the very, very top end of resistance to these uh, unfortunately continuing attacks. Um, we also look, there's a couple of other points here. The, the, the number of field service professionals stating they wouldn't tr put, trust putting sensitive data in the cloud has fallen from 13% to, to just 6%. And as I mentioned, that 3% of respondents who stated everything should remain on premise because there is too much risk in the cloud, that's disappeared entirely. So while security is a concern still, and it's not something we can turn a blind eye to, absolutely, I think the the... The message that seems to be coming across is um, security is something that we need to be focused on and cloud security is just one other element. Um, I, I seem to recall uh, anecdotally somebody telling me that the majority of um, data breaches uh, are usually not cloud-based. It's to do with a disgruntled employee going in with a, a, a dodgy uh, CD or USB stick and, and that, that's a much easier routine. So I think... Is, is there a danger that we're associating cloud with security risks more so than just the, the regular means of um, making sure our, our uh, data is secure by you know, when it's on-premise? Or it, 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 Are we perhaps positioning too much emphasis on the fact that cloud has risk when all other forms of computing have risk, is, is what I'm getting at? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, security in the cloud is a uh, it, it's shorthand for a particular fear about uh, information being out there and, and uh, ostensibly out of your control. Mm. But it, indeed, I mean, you raise a good point that there are lots of internal uh, people who can also cause mischief. Um, and I, I think that's that's that probably is less of a problem in the kind of field service ma ma management space yeah. than it would be uh, somewhere like a financial services institution where you know insiders can do uh, you know can g generate a lot of benefit for themselves by by manipulating financial controls um, but but nonetheless it, I mean security is a holistic thing it, it's 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 physical security it's cloud security it's uh, it, it's all of the above and so you know you as I, I'll, I'll repeat myself, you can't take it lightly. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's better to be putting uh, your trust in people who indeed can't fail and if, uh, can afford the leading minds in the world today to be able to stay ahead of all of the bad actors and let the organizations who we serve focus on what they do best, which is field service. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let, let's kind of finish this session before we move into the Q&A, uh, just with a, a brief, um, Look forward to 2017. Um, how important is cloud going to be in terms of um, being an enabler for other tools such as the Internet of Things, um, augmented reality, etc., um, for for field service management systems? And how, how how important will cloud and all these other tools kind of come together? It's kind of a coming together of a number of different technologies, isn't it, at the same time? It is. I mean, I think it all comes down to connectivity and communication between different endpoints on the network. And I think that's less, I mean, cloud is just one manifestation of that. And, you know, internet connectivity is really what we're, we're talking about. And so that kind of connectivity is underpinning internet of things and everything that's going on there. It's, in, it's, uh, it's underpinning augmented reality where you're adding uh, additional data on the fly. And you can do that because of connectivity and because of uh, compute power at the hub being pushed out to uh, being pushed out to these devices uh, around the network so it's uh, it's inexorable I, I obviously connectivity is only going to increase I think um, it, it's interesting in different I, I think at different rate of pace depending on the different market dynamics I'm talking about sort of geographically here and um, you know developing countries where maybe the IT infrastructure isn't as robust and you need some more considerations around offline capability, which is you know something that we're, we're well aware of with offline environments and field service professionals working in mines. They obviously haven't got connectivity yeah. yet, but you know I think it's uh, only a matter of time before even those barriers disappear and, uh, and more and more capabilities enabled by, by the internet. Yeah, I mean, we, we could take the, uh, the case of the London Underground, as example, which now has uh, connectivity right for it. You know, the, the, the barriers really, really are coming down. Uh, one final point here. Um, of course, it's not just technology that is shifting our, our industry. It's also um, the way we think and the way we approach service. And uh, um, a very kind offer from Paul and his colleagues at Click Software is to get a free copy of this excellent industry book. Um, I was very lucky and pleased to have been given uh, one of the first copies um, when it first came out towards uh, uh, halfway through last year. And I can vouch for it being, first of all, packed with insight. Um, Mike Karskin, Steve Smith and Alec Berry, who wrote this, wouldn't thank me kindly if I mentioned how many collective years experience they have between them. Um, but let's just say there's an awful lot of experience uh, that's gone into this book. Um, yet it's not a, a phenomenally heavyweight tomb. It's, it's very concisely written, uh, very well written. And it focuses on um, turning some of the common field service challenges into customer engagement opportunities. And uh, some of those are technology based. Uh, some of those are just outside of the box thinking as well. And I'll leave this up for a moment so you guys can uh, make a note of that link. We will send out a follow up email um, after the webinar um, uh, that will give you a, a copy of the, the hard copy of the webinar. Um, uh, video recording so you can come back and, and kind of peruse at your leisure some of the, the insight that Paul's given us today. Um, but fairly easy one to remember, bit.ly forward slash services hard and that'll take you to a page where you can just fill in a couple of details to make sure that book gets sent to you in the right place and that's a free copy of that fantastic book. 
I'll leave that up as we kind of move into the Q&A, actually, I think, Paul. That's probably the best thing, so people can kind of get that, that URL in their, in their mm-hmm. minds and write it down, etc. Uh, a few good questions have come in. Um, one question uh, here. I wanted to ask uh, how you feel about transferring data between third-party specialists and how moving to the cloud may facilitate that. Um, so, it, so it's it's true. Obviously, there need to be uh, agreements and SLAs in place, and, and make sure all the data protection considerations are are in place. But obviously, the notion of um, cloud is that you've got a hub, and and there can be different uh, spokes coming out from that hub that people can access a single unified view of a of a particular record. Could be a could be a customer record, could be a service lifecycle record, and so. Um, having individual field service professionals be able to look at the latest information even while uh, tasks and service requests are being made by an organization, um, you know, that's very powerful. You you no longer uh, have um, disparate databases where you've got all of this information scattered. It is possible to aggregate this in in one place and it is possible for multiple people with uh, very distinct access levels uh, and very highly controllable granular access to the data to be able to get at what they need to look at without necessarily looking at the the whole picture. Um, so that's uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's a great um, great facilitator of of communication uh, for, with third parties. Okay, fantastic. Um, another question here. You mentioned uh, briefly the additional computation power of the cloud, Paul. Um, would you be able to explain exactly how that works in a little bit more detail? And there's a, a, a in brackets here, but please use layman's terms. <laughs> layman's terms. Uh, yes, certainly. So uh, again, if you if you think of the cloud as uh, there's a hub, and that hub's got a lot of computing capability. It's got the, you know there's massive server resources there. So if you want to be doing very complex, intensive calculations, then you've got the resources at that central hub to be able to do those calculations and then pass the answer back to uh, down a spoke into uh, into an area um, that's connected to, to the cloud. So the example that I used was being able to run lots and lots of simulations to work out um, a, a very precisely optimized schedule, giving, um, bearing in mind some very specific business KPIs that an organization is yeah. interested in. It's very um, com- computationally expensive to, to do that. And so to have the resources locally would be prohibitive, or you could have them, but then they'd probably be sitting idle a lot of the time. And that's, uh, you know, hardware uh, and, uh, you know, iron that's sitting there in, uh, in your organization that isn't being used fully to the max. Whereas the cloud, n- not only does it give you the capabilities to undertake that's comp- that computationally expensive, that sort of uh, difficult set of uh, algorithms, uh, but it also does it in a cost-effective way where you can scale up and use that uh, computational power, and then when you don't you need it, you can scale down. Um, so it's, it's both cost-effective and, you know, gives you, uh, enables you to take advantage of functional capabilities uh, that would be prohibitive. Okay, fantastic. Um... A question here, uh, is there any particular type of organization that you're seeing moves to the cloud? Are you seeing any patterns? Uh, I'm guessing that's kind of uh, looking at um, you know, perhaps verticals or company sizes, or, or is, is there even something in the DNA of the companies? Are these companies naturally um, companies that I would say lead an edge, but we're perhaps um, beyond that in terms of cloud, but are they kind of more forward thinking companies? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a correlation between organizational agility, and that's more about the uh, how quickly they can transfer processes um, and and business processes to a to a cloud based environment with with the change management side of things. And so, um, th- there is a pull for organizations that have got customer facing uh, requirements, um, mm-hmm. sort of retail telco type type situations. Um, I, I think there's sort of accelerated interest there. Um, and I think on the other si- side of it, there are organizations that have got some more regulatory constraints and considerations around uh, the nature of their um, operational expenditure. 
such as uh, in the utility space where they, they may not, through not necessarily fault over their own, but they can't move as quickly uh, in, into, this, into this different model and the, and the OPEX associated with it. When, they're, when their models and their business cases and their, um, their history is based on uh, capital expenditure. And so there's sort of a financial slash regulatory consideration which is definitely a factor and influences, you know, which industries are able to move a little faster than others. Okay, and um, one final question here, and it looks like we're just, uh, we've got time for one, one brief uh, last question uh, to close the session off, and it kind of leads neatly from that, that last one we looked at. Um, security aside, is there any other reason why a company would not want to move to the cloud? I think you covered a couple of, um, couple of points there, but from a, a sheer um a practical point of view um yeah kind of stepping aside from the the regulatory reasons and the uh perhaps financial reasons um is there any other reason um other than fears around security why the cloud why an on-premise solution is preferred to cloud um i i think only it's inertia around change management i think yeah. uh i mean it's a it's a practical reason it, it requires some resources uh, and some investment to to be able to uh, organize your um, your processes and your field service team around a new way of uh, operating. Now, of course, as we can see from the survey, everybody who's done it are happy that they've done it. And it's really just a question of, uh, in some ways, it, it might seem like grasping the nettle in that yeah. uh, you know there's going to be some short short term pain as there is with anything, but you know to get the benefit out of it and um, you really need to be able to move your business to the to the next level. Um, I, I think that's really the uh, it's a genuine barrier, but it's one I think that's um, that you know organisations are, are definitely um, is in their interests to overcome. Yeah, and perhaps one that is dare I say it more of a a mental barrier than a uh, actual challenge. There, there is challenges there, but it, like you say, it's grasping the nettle, taking that first step. You know, um, if you want to, what's the old adage? If you want to walk six thousand miles, you have to take a first step to do so. Um, brilliant! I think that, that that's kind of uh, it's really useful insight there. Uh, there are one or two questions that we've not had time to get round to, guys. So uh, what I will say is, those questions we haven't had a chance to respond to in the session, we will um, get in touch with you directly um, via email. Um, this webinar will be made available um, as a, a download uh, coming up soon. And please do remember to uh, visit the uh, Bitly Services Hard, um, and we will, uh, and you'll get your copy of that fantastic book on its way. But from now, all it remains for me to say thank you ever so much um, for first of all, Paul, joining us and giving sharing your your insight and your knowledge with us on this session. Paul, um, pleasure as always, and we look forward to uh, working with you again on some uh, further research in the future. Um, and finally, thank you to everybody that's logged in, um, taking time out from your busy working days, which we appreciate as well. So uh, we shall speak to you all very soon. And from now, thanks again. We'll speak to you uh, in the near future. Bye-bye.